Wyoming in the 1940s. Wonderful Wyoming, state of promise, land of far horizons. Horizons, promise, also pigeons, lots and lots of pigeons. There was a serious infestation of pigeons. That's Roger McDaniel, a Wyoming historian and author. He also served in both houses of the Wyoming State Legislature. And the pigeon infestation he's talking about was at his old workplace at the Wyoming State Capitol. That is the start of season two of Rachel Maddow Presents Ultra, the podcast in which Rachel once again introduces us to a U.S. senator I have never heard of. Lester Hunt is the man who climbed out on the window ledges at the state capitol to drop poison to kill the pigeons. Lester Hunt, when he did this, was the newly elected governor of the state of Wyoming. It gives me pleasure to introduce to you at this time the Honorable Lester Hunt, uh, governor of Wyoming. He set his sights on the U.S. Senate, and he won that race, too. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Lester C. Hunt. United States Senator from Wyoming. The most popular politician in his state. Lester Hunt, newly elected a U.S. Senator. He heads to Washington to do what he has always done, to advocate for his constituents, for the people of Wyoming, also now to try to do some good for the whole rest of the country through service in the United States Senate. He is as poised as anyone could be for success in that job. But things are about to change for him. Radically. What he is about to encounter in Washington will cost him his life. He will not live to see the end of even one term as U.S. Senator. Joining us now is Rachel Maddow. You can get the first episode of Ultra's second season now everywhere you listen to podcasts. You can also subscribe to MSNBC Premium on the Apple Podcast app to get every new episode early and ad free. Rachel, I, I can't take it. Uh, listen, we, we, got, we got 10 minutes. It's just us. Tell me all the okay. rest of it right now. <laughs> like the, I can't wait for the next episode. Just go. So then what happens? It, yeah, it, it, well, I mean, and then there's us at the end of it, like it becomes the America that we know. Um, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Thank you so much for letting me come on your show to talk about it and for listening to it and for liking it. Um, Lester Hunt is, is, I mean, he's not a completely forgotten figure, but the thing, things went so badly for him very quickly after he got to Washington that what I was sort of trying to do in episode one is create, I think, the sense of the lost possibility. Like, he really did lose his life to this scandal that I'm, write, that I'm writing about and working on in this podcast. And it's a huge loss for the country because he did have a long, bright future ahead of him if everything else in his life leading up to that moment uh, was anything to go by. And I sort of feel like I've become really good at resurrecting old villains who we had forgotten mm -hmm. about from history. But Lester Hunt is one of the good guys who we need to kind of unearth and remember his legacy to. And the loss of him to something that went really wrong with extremism in American politics uh, is something that we should um, regret and remember and commemorate. Yeah. So he, he's a Democrat getting elected in Republican Ohio, uh, Wyoming, Wyoming. Uh, difficult thing to do uh, and impressive no matter when you hear that. Uh, you know, he's kind of the John Tester of his time there yeah. uh, in, in that situation. Uh, but but apparently very naive uh, when, when he gets to Washington in such a way. And and not, I'm speaking beyond what I know. Because uh, all I know is episode one, but clearly he gets eaten up by Washington, and so this is yeah. this is a drama about more than him, though. So there's this. What happens with him, um, and you'll get there very quickly in the next couple of episodes, um, is that he come he is confronted in the Senate with the first major thing he does in the Senate. There is another senator who is in the opposite party, who is kind of his opposite number, and this other senator gets involved in a Nazi propaganda campaign, um, a foreign influence operation, which is an absolutely outrageous, like, dirty, false conspiracy theory 
tale that is designed to hurt the United States. And Lester Hunt realizes what this other senator is doing. He's absolutely repulsed by it. Um, and they come to loggerheads in the Senate over this thing that this other senator is trying to advance. And part of the reason that I wanted to do this story was learning that while that is happening, while they are becoming mortal enemies in the United States Senate, they also live next door to one another and their backyards back up onto each other's houses. And while they have decided they are out to destroy each other, they can see how the other one of them, how, how each other are living. And that only ratchets up the revulsion that Lester Hunt has for this other senator. And he just decides, you know what, I'm just going to take the political risk. I've got to stand up against a monster like this. And he does. And it's for the good of the country. And it costs him his life. Um, but what he is fighting for and the reason he is fighting against that foreign influence operation in Washington and what like the low down dirty depths that some people were willing to go for for political gain is an inspiration to me, even though it cost him his life. So the, the first season of Ultra taught us about uh, the pull that fascism had in the United States, the attraction that it had for some people, how far they were willing to go to advance the cause of fascism here. Uh, and yeah. this is this takes us and that's pre World War II. Uh, and into World War II, that, that story. And, and this takes us to a period after World War II where it, it hasn't, you make the point that those people, most of them tended to disappear after Pearl Harbor, uh, but that didn't mean they stopped thinking what they were thinking. And it also didn't mean they went away in politics. I mean, one of the things that you and I talked about a lot with, with Ultra Season 1 was that that became kind of a forgotten story. The Great Sedition Trial, mm -hmm. all the Americans who sort of worked with a Nazi agent, who sided with the Nazis, who wanted the Nazis to win World War II, um, they were defeated um, in the United States one way or another. And that means that we forgot their stories. Um, and it means we forgot their stories pretty quickly. And so when they were all kind of let go and didn't have to, you know, they didn't get prosecuted for it, they were successfully prosecuted for it. Or, um, you know, in, in the case of members of Congress, none of them were prosecuted at all. Their story was mostly forgotten. And those of whom, those of them that stayed in public life kept being the same kind of people they were before. And so, um, for example, uh, one of the characters in Ultra Season 2 is a guy who was part of the Silver Shirts and linked to the German-American Bund and was writing for Father Charles Coughlin's publication. Those were all entities that we learned about in Ultra Season 1. In Ultra Season 2, he ends up being the subject of an international years-long manhunt by the United States government as what they, they believe him to be not just an American fascist, but an American fascist and a traitor and possibly possibly a nuclear terrorist. Um, so this stuff gets just gets worse when mm -hmm. these people get away. And he ends up involved with a Republican senator um, in the United, who is a sitting senator in the United States Senate. So um, when you let these folks go away, uh, get away with things, uh, it's important that you at least keep tabs on them to see where else they're going to turn up mm -hmm. because it's never good. So uh, how many episodes, Rachel? Eight. Eight. OK. Uh, and those of us who want, say, 16 or 24, is there any <laughs> what do we do? Uh, but so you you tell stories in your show that are similar to this. They tend to be in the 20 to 25 minute range, something like that. <clears throat> Each podcast episode is significantly longer than that. What is the difference for you as a storyteller in the way you approach the podcast as opposed to the way you approach the show? Very good question. So the podcast is basically, it's a, it's a little book, right? It's a, it's a, or it's a TV show. Like if you think about it that, like mm -hmm. it's, if you put all the, the episode lengths together, it ends up being something that I want to be able to hold your attention for about four or five hours. Um, and so in order to hold your attention for that time, it has to be well told. We use a lot of archival audio, a lot of historical audio, finding the Wisconsin, I'm mean, sorry, the, the Wyoming audio archives yeah. to get the sound of Lester Hunt's voice was an incredible odyssey and super fun. Um, but the idea is that this is a single story arc that can't be told in the course of a TV show. Mm -hmm. You need to stick with it for an eight episode 
arc. But by the time you get to the end of it, you should have learned a whole new thing about American history and hopefully be sort of propelled in, along the way by the dramatic interest in it so that it sticks. Um, I want these stories to be memorable. Like, I'm not just interested in these stories because they're not well known. I'm interested in these stories because I think they should be well known. Like, we should all remember Lester Hunt. We should remember that there was an internationally wanted American fascist fugitive who was involved with a Republican senator <laughs> at the outset of the Cold War. Like, we should understand what happens when the great sedition trial in the United States ends with all of those people getting away and all of those seditionist movements effect effectively getting away without ever being criminally held, held criminally accountable for what they'd been charged with. Um, I want those stories to be vernacular, to be part of the way that we think about our history as Americans in dealing with really strong anti-democratic challenges, because we have a strong anti-democratic challenge right now. So we should know what's kind of in our armamentarium of options for how to respond to it and what's worked well in the past and what hasn't.